Good day and welcome to this webinar on nutritional strategies to maintain bone mass in older adults. My name is Dominique Pierrot and I'm the science manager at IOF. I will be the moderator of this webinar. Before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. And I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing them in the Q&A box. I will voice them towards the speaker towards the end of this webinar. This being said, I have the great privilege to welcome today Professor Thierry Chevalier, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, Professor Chevalier is head of the Geriatric Liaison Service in the Department of Rehabilitation and Geriatrics and a consultant physician in the service of bone disease, diseases at Geneva University Hospitals. In addition to his involvement in pre and postgraduate medical teaching, his research interests include comprehensive geriatric assessment, the epidemiolo epidemiology of fracture and secondary fracture prevention, fraction liaison services, the influence of genetic and environmental factors on bone microstructure. Professor Chevalier is also a member of the scientific committee of IOF and SKO, and a reviewer and member of the editorial board of several scientific journals in the geriatric and bone fields. Thanks again, Professor Chevalier, for having accepted our invitation to present today. And uh, we are listening to your presentation. Hi to everyone and uh, thank you, Dominique, for your kind introduction. I would like to thank the organizers of these webinars for giving me the opportunity to present this talk on uh, nutritional strategies to maintain bone mass in uh, older adults. I have no disclosure. And uh, the objectives of this webinar are to learn the pivotal roles of optimized nutritional status for better bone health at older age, then to review the effects of uh, nutritional supplements after a fracture on clinical outcomes, and finally to highlight effective nutritional strategies aimed to improve musculoskeletal health at uh, older age. Now, two factors are involved in the occurrence of osteoporotic fractures. These are sarcopenia, which is associated with falls through a decrease of muscle strength and also neuromuscular impairment, and therefore induce a mechanical overload. And on the other hand, osteoporosis, which results in medical, mechanical incompetence. Therefore, the fracture is followed by a process of repair and then by rehabilitation to restore independence by reducing disabilities and also later on the prevention of the subsequent fracture. And of course, malnutrition is known to have an impact both on sarcopenia and on osteoporosis and on the processes of both uh, fracture repair and rehabilitation. Malnutrition is an underestimated uh, factor as shown in this prospective evaluation of about uh, 1,000 German patients hospitalized in orthopedic and uh, trauma department uh, with a mean age of about uh, 60 years of age. And you can see that the prevalence of malnutrition as defined with a score of three and above with a nutritional risk screening concerns almost one quarter of the patients. And you can see also that the prevalence of malnutrition increased significantly according to age, especially after the age of 70 years. Furthermore, you can see that patients at risk for malnutrition with NRS uh, above, egal or above three had a prolonged hospitalization, delayed post-op mobilization, and also delayed mobilization after conservative treatment. Now, does the prefracture nutritional status predict functional status at discharge during the acute phase with hip fracture patients? 
in this multi-center prospective uh, cohort study, functional independent measurements, the FIM score, especially the motor one, the 13 motor items, were at discharge, were higher in patients who were well nourished than in those who were malnourished or at risk of malnutrition, as assessed with the short form of the mini nutritional assessment. And after adjusting for confirming factors, multiple regression analysis shows that prefracture MNA short form was a significant independent predictor for functional status at discharge during the acute phase, justifying early assessment of nutritional status and early intervention for successful uh, postoperative rehabilitation. Now, what about the effects of nutritional status on six months outcome of hip fracture in elderly patients? In the study performed in Hong Kong, among uh, more than 200 patients with a mean age of 83 years, patients with hip fractures, the prevalence of malnutrition as assessed with the MNR short form was high and was associated with a poor functional recovery with a higher proportion of elderly care residents in the at-risk and in the malnourished groups. Now, does malnutrition have an impact on mortality at 12 months after an acute hip fracture? In these above 300 patients with mainly women and the mean age of 83 years, 43% of them were malnourished according to the subjective global assessment tool. And we can see that uh, with the logistic regression analysis demonstrated after adjusting for clinically relevant covariates that malnutrition with an odds ratio of 2.4 and being admitted from residential aged care facility with an odds ratio of 2.6 uh, independently predicted 12 months uh, mortality. Therefore, effective strategies to identify and treat malnutrition in hip fracture should be prioritized. Now, what is the prevalence of uh, vitamin E deficiency in hip fracture patients? In this uh, Swiss uh, study, among above 200 uh, consecutive hip fracture patients with a mean age of 86 years and the majority of uh, women, you can observe that the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency as defined with the serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D uh, below 30 nanomole per liter was 50% among hip fracture coming from whom? And it was 70% among who's from assisted living and 77% in who's from nursing homes. On the other hand, only 10% of these patients had any vitamin D supplementation on admission to acute care. Now, does vitamin D and calcium supplementation have a role to play in older adults? Very recently, a systematic umbrella review of meta-analysis shows that vitamin D plus calcium supplementation was associated with a reduction in two thirds of 12 meta analyses regarding the risk of hip fractures, and in seven of the 11 systematic review regarding any fracture. It should be noted that the baseline level of vitamin D available in five of these meta analyses were between 21 and 83 nanomoles per liter. Nevertheless, this reduction of hip and any fracture with calcium and vitamin D was possibly driven by findings from institutionalized individuals. On the other hand, it has been shown that high serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D values have been shown to be associated with an increased risk of falls, as recently reported in the Boston Stopy trial on the effect of calcium plus vitamin D on bone mineral density. 
this observational study analyzed the risk of falling as a secondary uh, endpoint in these uh, 410 men and women, uh, elderly women, men and women, with a baseline 25 hydroxy vitamin D of 55 nanomole per liter. <clears throat> we can see that intratrial mean of 25 hydroxy vitamin D defined as the mean of all measurements from six months to time to the first uh, fall was significantly associated with the risk of falling in a U-shaped pattern. So as we can see that the range associated with minimal risk of falling was between 50 and 100 nanomole per liter, which corresponds to the range recommended for bone health. Now, what are the factors influencing protein use in older persons? The following three factors influence protein use in older individuals. First, the inadequate intake of protein, like in the case of anorexia or aging, but also the reduced ability to use available protein, like in the case of insulin resistance or stomach extraction, but also in case of greater need of, for protein, like in inflammatory disease. These three, par <coughs> these three uh, factors may induce a loss of functionality and contribute to increased risk of sarcopenia, osteoporosis, and impaired immune system. Therefore, <coughs> the recommended intake of protein of 0.8 gram per kilogram of body weight can be up to 1.1 to 1.3 gram per kilogram of body weight in the frail uh, patients. Now, what is the relationship between peripheral skeletal bone strength not captured by area BMD and dietary protein intakes from various origins in healthy postmenopausal women? In a cross-sectional study in healthy women from the Geneva retires cohort, with a mean age of 65 years of age, mean and the mean dietary calcium and protein intake greater than the recommended. The predicted failure load and stiffness as the distal radius and distal tibia were positively associated with total animal and dairy proteins, but not with vegetable protein intake. Now, what about the consumption of fermented uh, dairy products, including, including yogurts, which provide not only calcium, phosphor, and protein together, but with prebiotics and probiotics on age-related changes of bone uh, microstructure? Among almost 500 postmenopausal women enrolled in the Geneva with our cohort, with three years of follow-up, we can observe that the, the, it was an attenuated cortical bone loss after three years at the distal radius, independently of total energy, calcium, or protein intakes. In fact, there was no difference in areal BMD and at the tibia. Therefore, this age-related cortical bone loss was attenuated at non-bearing bone sites in fermented dairy products consumers, but not in milk or whipped cheese consumers. Now, what is the impact on the fracture risk of a high versus low dietary protein intake in other adults? In the systematic uh, meta-analysis of four cohorts, uh, of four cohort studies, including subjects above the age of 65 years of age, higher dietary protein intake was associated with a significant decrease of 11% of hip fractures. Therefore, protein intake above the current uh, RDA of 0.8 gram per kilogram of body weight per day from any source may reduce hip fracture risk and may play a beneficial role in BMD maintenance and loss in older adults. Now, 
what is the association between dairy consumption and the risk of hip fracture? In the best meta-analysis, higher as compared to the lowest consumption of yogurt was associated with a 22 lower risk of hip fracture, but this was not observed with milk or cheese. But for milk, a 25 lower risk of heat fracture with higher milk consumption was observed in the USA, but not in the Scandinavian countries. Therefore, the risk of heat fracture may, may not be elevated among people who consume milk, yogurt, and cheese, and the greater consumption of milk or yogurt may even be associated with a lower risk of heat fractures. Now, what are the effect of improving data resources of uh, calcium and protein intakes on uh, hip fractures and falls in uh, residential care? And these patients were repeat in vitamin D. And in this two-year cluster randomized control trial, the intervention group was provided with additional milk yogurt and cheese, achieving therefore a total intake of calcium of 1142 milligram of calcium per day and 1.1 kilogram gram of, uh, per kilogram of body weight of uh, protein as compared to 700 of milligram of calcium and 0.9 gram of, per kilogram of, uh, per day of, uh, of protein and rest as, as compared to those with the usual uh, menu. A total of 324 fractures, including 135 hip fractures, and above 4,000 falls were observed. The intervention was associated with a reduction of 33% of all fractures, of 46% of hip fractures, and 10% reduction of falls. And we have regarding the NNT, 52, 82, and only 17 for the full reduction. Therefore, improving calcium and protein intakes by using dairy foods is a readily accessible intervention that reduces the risk of falls and fractures in aged care residents. Now, what are the effect of milk supplementation which contains a number of bone beneficial nutrients on bone health in adults. In a meta-analysis, including a 20 randomized control trial, milk supplementation resulted in a small but significant increase in BMT at the hip and lumbar spine, but not at the femoral neck. Therefore, the addition of milk to the diet may potentially increase the likelihood of preventing bone loss by restoring bone homeostasis through the modulation of the calcium vitamin D PTH axis, bone remodeling rate, and growth hormone IGF-1 axis. Now, what are the effects of a short-term oral uh, intervention with uh, protein and vitamin D on falls in uh, malnourished older adults. 200 malnourished uh, adults, uh, elderly, were admitted to an acute uh, hospital to receive nutritional intervention, which consists to energy and protein and rich diet, oral nutritional supplements, calcium vitamin D supplements, telephone counseling by a dietitian for three months after discharge, or usual care. And we can observe that three months after discharge, we observed a significant decrease of the number of patients who fell, as well as a reduction in the number of fall incidents in those who were supplemented with nutritional intervention. Therefore, a short-term oral nutritional intervention in malnourished older adults decrease the number of patients who fall and fall incidents. Now, does 
baseline serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D concentration and protein intake influence changes in muscle mass and function in other adults who receive nutritional intervention. Among 380 sarcopenic older adults who received vitamin D, who received vitamin D and leucine and rich whey protein medical nutrition drink for 13 weeks, and who had a baseline 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentration above 50 nanomol per liter and dietary protein intake above one gram per kilogram per day gained independent of other determinants, more appendicular muscle mass and improved lower extremity function as assessed by the chair stand test compared with controls. Therefore, sufficient levels of sufficient baseline levels of 25 hydroxyvitamin D and protein intake may be required to increase muscle mass. Now for the management of elderly patients with malnutrition, a critical pathway was set up in the geriatric hospital in, in Geneva. It means that for patients with a MNR short form, assessed within the first 48 hours after admission, below 12, they were classified according to the full MNR into three nutritional categories. Malnourished patients were referred for personalized evaluation and care to the dietitian. A patient at risk of malnutrition had a three day semi-contactive evaluation of their spontaneous uh, nutritional intake and the weight uh, follow up once a week. Uh, the control group was managed according to the usual standard care, including the weekly uh, weight monitoring. And the low nutritional intake during patient follow up was defined as an intake of less than 75% of the offered meal, at least threefold, or a significant weight loss above 3% of the baseline weight causing the prescription of enriched food or oral nutrient, nutrient, nutritional supplements. And this targeted renutrition in the elderly inpatients were associated with an increase in serum IGF-1. Now, does oral protein supplements improve bone and clinical outcome in patients with a recent hip fracture? In the six months randomized double blind placebo control trial with a six months uh, post treatment follow up in Geneva, all patients receive 200 units of uh, a baseline of vitamin D to be repeated vitamin D, and they receive all 550 milligrams of calcium per day. And patients who receive 20 grams. 20 grams of protein supplements compared to those who received an isocaloric placebo had significantly greater increase in serum levels of IGF-1 at 6 and 12 months, and all over decrease of proximal femoral neck BMD at 12 months. And furthermore, a reduction of 33% of the median of the length of stay was also observed in the protein supplement group. So the beneficial effects of nutritional supplements after a hip fracture on clinical outcomes were recently reported by Daniel Pinto in Osteoporosité Nationale on behalf of the Rehabilitation Working Group of the IOS. And you can see that in the meta-analysis of the EU, medical complications and wound respiratory and urinary infection were significantly reduced with oral nutritional supplementation. And as well as in the Cochrane database systematic review, the composite outcome of death or complication were significantly reduced. Now, what are the impact of vegetarian and vegan diets on bone mineral density and fracture risk? In the systematic review and the meta-analysis, 20 studies were included with many uh, participants. 
as shown on this slide, vegetarians and vegans taken together as compared with omnivores had higher factor risk. And when vegetarians and vegans were analyzed separately, only vegans as compared to omnivores had significantly higher fracture rates. Vegetarians and vegans had also lower bone mineral density at the femoral neck and lower spine. This higher risk of fracture was also reported in the EPIC Oxford study, including a high number of men and women with 11% higher risk of all fractures in the vegetarian as compared to meat eaters, which was reduced to 9% after adjustment for lower BMI. Larger differences were even seen for E fractures with a 34 higher risk of E fracture in vegetarians, which was reduced to 25 after adjustment for BMI. And for vegans, the risk of all fractures before and after adjustment for BMI were 50 and 33 percent higher, respectively, while the risk for hip fracture were 131 percent higher. So now, what is the relationship between fruits and vegetables intakes and bone health? In a systematic review of randomized uh, control trials and court studies, the fruit and vegetable intakes was associated with a pool reduction of 8% of hip fractures with a moderate heterogeneity. The risk of any fracture was decreased by 10% based on only two core studies. Therefore, there was an association between the increase of at least one serving of fruits and vegetables per day and decrease in the risk of fracture. Now, what is the impact of a Mediterranean diet on fracture risk? In this meta-analysis, including more than 350,000 individuals with over 6,000 cases of incident hip fracture, adherence to the Mediterranean diet, which you know includes uh, daily intakes of fruit and vegetables, nuts, uh, dairy products, olive oil, fish, uh, fresh seafood, eggs, white meat, and less red meat, and less fatty acid and sugar foods. And adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with a reduction of 21% of hip fractures, such that one unit increase in the score of adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with a reduction of 5% in the risk of hip fracture. Now, could this beneficial effect of the Mediterranean diet be attributed to a favorable effect on falls. In a prospective court study with more than 2,000 community uh, ed, uh, wedding holder Spanish adults, uh, age 65 years, of the seniors Enrica study, followed over a median time of 3.5 years, 90% of these people reported at least uh, uh, one fall. And you can see that after adjustment for potential confounders, participants in the highest tertile of adherence show the 28% lower frequency of falling as compared with those in the lowest tertile. On the other hand, no significant effect was observed for falls uh, requiring health care or for falls with uh, uh, severe injuries. Now, what are the effects? of omega-3 on health outcome in healthy community dwelling elderly. Uh, so in the Do Health uh, randomized clinical, clinical trial among above uh, 2,000 elderly adults who had no major health event in the five years prior to enrollment and had sufficient mobility and good cognitive uh, status, one gram per day of omega-3 for three years had no significant effect on these clinical outcomes, including either the SPPB 
for the functional aspect, but also on non-vertebral fractures. Now, does daily omega-3 fatty acids supplements have an impact on the incidence of uh, total and injurious uh, falls among healthy other adults of the Do Health uh, study? More than 3,000 falls were recorded over the three years of uh, supplementation. And you can see that supplementation with omega-3 as compared to no uh, supplementation, reduce total falls by 10%. Therefore, omega-3 supplementation may have a modest benefit on the incidence of total falls among generally uh, act healthy, active, and uh, vitamin D uh, repeat uh, uh, older adults. Now, what about the role of vitamin K in bone and muscle metabolism. So in vivo and in vitro models for osteoporosis and uh, sarcopenia suggest that vitamin K could exert, could, could exert a positive uh, effect uh, in both uh, conditions. So uh, vitamin, vitamin K, a cofactor for the gamma glutamyl uh, carboxylase enzyme, is required for the post transitional activation of uh, osteocalcin and the matricular uh, protein, which play a, a key role uh, in, uh, in bone. And uh, it was also reported that uh, vitamin K in bone improves uh, osteoblast uh, function by the stimulation of uh, osteogenesis and also induction uh, of osteoblast differentiation and has also an effect, an inhibitory effect on bone uh, resorption by inhibition of osteoclas osteoclastogenesis and induction of osteoclast apoptosis. And on the muscle as part, uh, vitamin K is also implicated in the regulation of early uh, myogenesis and also for the regulation of energy uh, metabolism. And uh, as recently reported in CTI by Alonso, uh, several recent uh, observational studies uh, suggest a link between a high vitamin K intake and increased PMD in both East Asian and European populations. However, most of uh, these studies are limited by a rather small uh, cohort size or the lack of uh, vitamin K measurements in the serum of uh, plasma. Or plasma. Uh, in addition, the study population were rather heterogeneous, including high, either healthy individuals, elderly individuals, or osteoporotic women, even renal patients, or children with low trauma fractures. And furthermore, it was also mentioned that the results of uh, supplementation studies were uh, inconsistent. So finally, have dietary intake of vitamin C oriented foods a protective effect on bone? In the systematic review and the meta analysis, including 17 studies with almost 20,000 subjects, subjects in the highest as compared to the lowest category of uh, vitamin C uptake has a 34% lower prevalence of uh, E fracture. And uh, furthermore, uh, dietary intake of vitamin C oriented foods showed beneficial effects with a significant positive correlation with BMD at both the lumbar spine and at the femoral neck. So we can say in summary that dietary intake of vitamin C oriented foods is negatively associated with the risk of hip fracture, osteoporosis, and PMD loss, suggesting that uh, vitamin D oriented foods may decrease the risk of hip fracture, osteoporosis, and uh, BMD loss. So in conclusion, about this uh, nutritional strategies to maintain bone mass in older adults, what we can uh, retain is that uh, a balanced diet 
including minimum of 0.8 gram per kilogram of body weight, but can be up to 1.3 gram per kilogram of body weight in the fried early. It needs also a calcium intake between 800 and 1,000 milligram per day, and fruit and vegetables with five servings per day. Now we can say that the part of the protein and calcium requirements are met with two to three servings per day of dairy products. Regarding vitamin D, what we know now is that uh, the requirement is uh, between 800 and 1,000 units per day, or 20 to 25 micrograms per day. And as a diet, a dietary pattern shown to be associated with a lower factor risk, such as, for example, a Mediterranean diet. So that was my last slide, and I would like to thank you all for your attention. And now we are ready for the question and answer part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chevalet, for this very comprehensive presentation. I'm sure it was greatly appreciated by our audience. And now I would like to move on, like you mentioned, to the Q&A session. Uh, maybe I will start with uh, one question while people are typing their question in the Q&A uh, box. So maybe my first question will be related to uh, vitamin D and uh, the study with high bolus of vitamin D. Uh, is, is there any hypothesis regarding the higher risk of falls or, and of fractures uh, observed in this, uh, in this patient who received a higher bolus of vitamin D? Uh, thank you, Dominique, for, for this question. This is effectively an important uh, notion that the bonus of high bonus of vitamin D was associated with a higher risk of falls and, uh, and fractures. And so far, the, there is some hypothesis that uh, high dose of vitamin D uh, stimulates release of HGF-23 from osteocytes, uh, which can impair the 1-alpha hydroxylation of 25-hydroxyvitamin D to 1-25 and also uh, promotes a 24-hydroxylation of 25 to the inactive form of 24-25 dehydroxyvitamin D. And uh, by this way, excessive vitamin D may cause insufficiency of the active metabolite of 1,25 dehydroxyvitamin D. So that's one of the hypotheses to explain why with high bonus of vitamin D are associated with an, uh, an increased risk of uh, falls and uh, fractures. Thank you. Uh, so Diane, Diane Beckett is asking if an increased uh, protein intake is recommended only for postmenopausal women, no, is recommended for postmenopausal women or just for the frail ones, and if it's only to the frail ones, how do you define frailty? Well, what, what, uh, my, my topic was uh, mainly on, uh, on uh, in older subjects. So it means that uh, all, the, almost all the studies that I talk about were concerned postmenopausal women. So uh, not only post frail uh, people. Yes, only uh, elderly people. Okay. Um, there is uh, one question from Marianne Annan um, asking if you can provide some information regarding uh, lactose intolerant person, um, because you know you mentioned that milk and dairy uh, data are quite interesting. But uh, this person is wondering, uh, do you know the, the about the large number of person who are like uh, um, to, uh, lactose intolerant? Well, in, in fact, uh, uh, what, what we can observe is that may, many people are complaining about lactose intolerance, but uh, in fact, when they are carefully analyzed, the, the percentage of, of people who are really lactose intolerant are quite low. Uh, so, for, of course, in this patient, you, you have to adapt and to avoid uh, some uh, dairy products. 
but in the majority, if they choose some uh, dairy products, it's, uh, it can be used. Thank you. Um, uh, somebody is asking uh, if you would um, recommend uh, sorry, to increase uh, baseline intake of nutrients for people taking medication, either anti-resorptive or anabolic medications. So is it a, a suggestion? It means that for people who are taking medication, it will be required that to improve their nutritional status. Yeah, exactly. Would, yes. would you suggest to yes, for these yes. people to increase? Yes, of course. I think it's the same as we said. For example, we know that we have to uh, uh, to add some uh, vitamin D and, and calcium in, in patients before receiving uh, antiosporotic medications. But on the other hand, I think. Uh, we have to be sure that this patient, especially elderly patient, will receive adequate uh, uh, protein intake because as I, as I have shown, protein are also important for fracture repair, for example, and, uh, and also for the other clinical outcome. So I think it's, it's a very good suggestion that uh, uh, not only calcium, vitamin D, but also proteins and so all nutritional aspects have to be taken into account uh, for patients before introducing uh, an, an anti osteomotic medication. Thank you for the question. Um, somebody is asking, um, you, might, you know, about dairy product and fracture. Uh, you show that it's good uh, to take dairy product, uh, but this person is content about is a concern or would like your opinion about the fact the fat contained in this in the dairy products yeah in this case you can you can you you can uh, take uh, for people who are afraid of the fat aspect of the dairy products you can uh, uh, have the option with lighter uh, products which contain less fat but uh, they will still contain uh, calcium and protein. Thank you. When uh, Sophia Ishalmon is asking uh, whether you would recommend uh, vitamin K2 supplementation for bone health or only uh, to improve nutritional intake. According to the literature and what I have shown in the last uh, review on this uh, subject, uh, I think we do not have enough uh, data uh, to uh, suggest to uh, give vitamin K supplementation to be sure that it will have a beneficial effect. But to, just to be sure that uh, adequate vitamin, uh, vitamin K intake uh, is, uh, is obtained, it's correct. But I don't, I don't think so far that we, we can say that we have to uh, supplement patients with vitamin K uh, in order to reduce uh, fracture risk. Um, now there is um, a question by Terry Brown. I don't know if you are aware about it. It seems that there are, uh, is, this person is asking if there are any studies showing the efficacy of, Jam of the Japanese pharmaceutical lactose Glacé used to treat osteoporosis. I suppose it's a kind of a vitamin K uh, preparation. Okay, no, I am not aware of this uh, of this product. Sorry. Yeah, I was. Yeah, that was my uh, <laughs> <laughs> my feeling. Um, okay, uh, then uh, uh, Face Fuller asked uh, the question earlier at the beginning of your webinar, so you didn't mention. You, you mentioned it later on. But uh, this person was asking about uh, the vegetarian food and the and and you know and the risk of hip fracture. But I think you have an answer to this question. I don't know if you yeah. want to add a word about it or not. No, I think it's uh, it, it's clear that especially vegan vegan diets are maybe uh, associated with a very higher risk of of, 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 of fractures more than vegetarians. But uh, in vegetarians, it depends because some of vegetarians are taking dairy products, so it's not a, a, a problem. Uh, 
the kill is asking um is mentioning you know that people uh don't eat nutrients but eat food so mm -hmm. it's uh, uh the dairy studies and the one on fruit and vegetables are uh, very reassuring uh, data it is asking uh if uh, anyone has developed and tested the id the ideal bone health food combination to optimize all the nutrients you reviewed. Oh. Yet to be like the best practical translation yeah. <laughs> of, uh, you know, like the best meal, or I suppose, like the optimal uh, menu. Mm, I am not aware of this kind of study, even if it would be, yes, a very nice uh, study to be performed. But maybe at first we, we will have to define what is the ideal uh, uh, diet and uh, because it has to be uh, taken for a long time to be efficient. So it means it has to be tasty, it has to be uh, reliable and things like that. But I think it's a good idea to think about uh, uh, quite a, a meal with a, a mixture of what we said, what was beneficial for, for bone and to, uh, but to take that for a long time until we, have, we can see, observe the beneficial effects. Because we know that, sorry, because we know that to modify the the habits of the nutritional habits, especially in elderly patients, is quite difficult. Yeah, and, and I'm sure it will have also to be adapted to the local habits because you have some oh, yes. cultural trends, yes. uh, different uh, in different uh, region of the world. So yeah. Yes, that's a very good point. Yes, of course. That's why sometimes we are speaking about nutrients and not uh, foods, but um, it will be yes. a nice exercise, of course, for, for the yes. patients, it will be more, uh, it will be easier to understand, maybe. Yes, yes. Um, so um, uh, we have more questions. Um, let me see. Um, oh, oh, yes. Uh, so the um, Christina Van. Uh, is asking if calcium fortified food um, uh, treated the same as food in which calcium is naturally occurring. Well, I think she's asking whether, you know, if it's uh, the same to take calcium fortified food or calcium uh, supplements. Yeah. yeah. I think what we know from the literature is that the, the absorption of calcium, either from foods or from supplements, uh, it's uh, it's quite good in both situations. So of course it's better to uh, to try to improve uh, natural intake with food of the of, of calcium. But uh, in any case, when the in, the spontaneous intake is not uh, sufficient, it's, the calcium supplements are well uh, uh, absorbed, especially carbonate of calcium. Very well absorbed. And uh, somebody to follow on this question is uh, um, asking, you know, if there with the calcium supplementation, if there is a risk of increased cardiovascular risk. Well, according to what the, 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 there, were, there have been many meta-analyses on the subject, but uh, in fact, uh, when we look carefully at all the data. We cannot say that uh, calcium uh, intake is very easily associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, um, um, it, it, coming it, it, back it is, uh, it, it, in the way that we recommend it, so it means with adequate intake, 800 to 1,000 milligrams per day. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Um, uh, yes, um, uh, another case puller is asking again, you know, if you are taking non-dairy uh, milk, uh, uh, do you get sufficient protein and calcium? Of like course, this soy milk? Yeah, or this, yes, um, yes. If you are taking soya, for example, it's a good way to, uh, to, have, uh, to replace uh, milk, for example. But are you getting yeah. enough uh, protein and calcium? Uh, you are you are getting enough protein, but you have to add some uh, some calcium. 
you have to fortify the chemical milk. And sometimes this kind of uh, milk are fortified, I suppose. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so there are many questions about uh, calcium, but of course, you know, uh, we cannot recommend uh, brands or names yeah, of uh, yeah. supplements. This is not the point of this uh, webinar. Um, maybe uh, this uh, question, if you can maybe repeat, what is the dose of calcium and vitamin D for elderly person for the prevention of osteoporosis? Yes. So I think what is important for, for calcium, uh, the intake has to be between 800 and 1,000 milligrams per day of calcium. And uh, for uh, vitamin D, it's also between 800 and 1,000 units per day. It's what it, and uh, when it's taken uh, uh, every day, it's, uh, it's the best way to take uh, vitamin D at, at, and to obtain uh, serum level of 25 oxy vitamin D to uh, at least 15 nanomoles per liter to avoid uh, vitamin D deficiency. As we, because we mentioned just before that it's better to take every day uh, 1,000 units of vitamin D uh, instead of uh, giving uh, every three or four months uh, a loading dose of vitamin D. Um, yeah, there are more questions on, uh, on supplements and um, uh, calcium. Uh, maybe just this one, I think you already, uh, yeah. Maybe a risk. No, you have not responded, but yes, that um, you can respond maybe on this one. So, uh, Sandra Georgetta is asking if there are any study regarding the consumption of so of soy product uh, uh, and the effect on bone health. Of, of what? Sorry. Soy products. Uh, the, uh, um... Like I the am... Jap Japanese natto, yes. you know, like yes, those yes, fermented. Yes. Soybeans and uh... yes, probably there are some studies, but I, have, I did not review uh, this this, uh, this aspect of the study. But I sorry. think there is quite a, a quite study. some literature about yeah. it. Yes, 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 yes. I'm oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if supplements are required, uh, would you recommend food-based supplements or non-food-based supplements? I think it's always better if it's uh, food-based supplements uh, because it will be taken regularly and uh, it's, uh, it's better integrated in the food habits of the patients, so that's the best. But sometimes you, you have to, to, to give some uh, supplements in, maybe in, uh, uh, in acute uh, situations. Because the requirements, at least, for example, for proteins, it's much higher in, uh, in, in acute situation. For example, after hip fracture, the patients need a high intake of, uh, of protein, maybe higher than uh, in the usual days. So in the end, it's really up to the physician to, yeah, to decide um, case by case. Exactly but you have to assess the protein intake of the, of the, of the patient, and even in the general elderly population. Thank you. And yes. um, thank you very much, Professor Chevalier. I think it's uh, time to conclude. Um, I would like to thank you all for your participation in this webinar. We will post the recording of the webinar on the IOF website, and you, re you, will receive it. Um, you will receive the link to the webinar, to the recording by email tomorrow in 24 hours. Uh, you will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar, and we would really appreciate your input and comments. And if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send us an email at webinar at osteoporosis.foundation. Thank you again, Professor Chevalet, for this very, very comprehensive talk. And goodbye to everyone. Thank you to all of you. Bye.